analyzing capacitors. Well, first, what is a capacitor? Well, from circuit theory, we remember that it's a device that has two terminals, so two wires coming out of it, and it stores and releases electric energy. In terms of its behavior, it supplies current to try to keep the voltage across its terminals constant. And in fact, it can supply for a short period of time, very large amounts of current. In the old days with film cameras, they needed flash photography. The flash was usually driven by a bank of capacitors that could drive for a very short period of time, a high amount of current through those flash bulbs. Let's consider for a moment a parallel plate capacitor. So we're going to have a top metal plate and a bottom metal plate, and we will apply a voltage to this. Now those plates are separated by a dielectric. So at least at DC, and we're talking about electrostatics, there's no current flowing. So when we apply a voltage, there will be an accumulation of positive charge, on this case on the top plate, and an accumulation of negative charge on the bottom plate. The capacitance is really a measure of how much electric energy a device can store for a given applied voltage. The higher the capacitance, even though we apply the same voltage, it accumulates more charge. So it makes sense then that we'll define capacitance as the charge divided by the applied voltage. Now notice I have the absolute value outside charge and applied voltage, and that's because the signs don't matter for capacitance. Let's lay out a recipe for analyzing capacitors based on everything we've been discussing in electrostatics so far. Step one, choose a convenient coordinate system. So if your capacitor looks rather rectangular-ish, well, Cartesian coordinates are probably best. If it looks rather cylindrical, cylindrical coordinates are probably best. If it looks rather spherical, spherical coordinates are probably best, and so on. Given the coordinate system, we're now ready to start solving this. The first thing we'll do is let each of the plates on the parallel, on the parallel plate capacitor or whatever capacitor it is, carry charges plus and minus Q. Given that, we will use Gauss's law to calculate the electric flux density. In order to use Gauss's law, this assumes we kind of know what the fields will look like between those plates. And so we go back to the information we discussed when it was when we were talking about fields around charge distributions. So we use that information to assume what the fields look like. We apply Gauss's law to actually put numbers and equations to it. Once we know the electric flux density, it's very easy to calculate the electric field intensity in the medium between the plates. We just use the constitutive relation. And so we divide the electric flux by the permittivity. Given the electric field intensity, we're now in a position to calculate the voltage between the plates because that's just the line integral of the electric field from plate to plate. We can choose any path from plate to plate. So of course we'll choose the one that's easiest. Now we have everything to calculate capacitance. So it's our charge divided by the applied voltage and we don't care about signs. Now in the final equation, that should not contain charge or applied voltage. The capacitance of a structure should only be a function of its size and shape and the permittivity of the medium between the plates. So if you've derived the equation and it has charge or voltage still in it, well, that's a mistake. So use that as a self-check. We're not going to do the derivations here, that will be in following examples. But well, one thing we're going to do is derive the capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor. And we'll also derive the capacitance for a coaxial line. 